Hello and welcome to today's webinar on reading the gravestones of early New England. My name is Geneva Morse, Vice President of Education and Programming here at American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be your moderator for today's session. This program is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Now, virtually all genealogists and family historians have an appreciation for old cemeteries, yet the epitaphs inscribed on early New England gravestones, those poetic messages expressing attitudes toward life, death, and eternity are usually just glanced over or completely ignored. And these epitaphs were chosen for a reason and knowing the literary context can actually increase our understanding of these historic epitaphs and even shed light on the lives of the deceased and their family members. So using several examples from early New England gravestones, epitaph expert John Hansen today will discuss how to understand the source of inspiration and the meaning behind these passages and what they really say about our ancestors. Our presenter, John Hansen, is a lifelong New Englander. Harvard English major and author of the book, Reading the Gravestones of Old New England. His article, Reading the Epitaphs of Old New England Gravestones is the cover story of the summer uh, 2022 issue of American Ancestors Magazine. You see that on your screen. He's given numerous presentations and written several articles on the subject of his epitaph research. And when not collecting verses in old graveyards, he is an executive and at an internet services company. So John will present for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. At any point during the presentation, go ahead and type your question into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. We are recording this event, and so starting later today, you can freely go back and review any of the content uh, from the presentation on our website, as well as our YouTube channel. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to John. Thank you very much, Ginevra, and thank you to all of you for making the time to listen this afternoon. Um, I think, Ginevra, you set it up very well. Um, obviously, there's a very rich tradition of scholarship on early gravestones amongst genealogists, historians, and also uh, historians of the imagery, uh, the iconography, and the carvers, but there's really been comparatively little done regarding the verse. If anything, these are typically overlooked, often dismissed as mere sentimental doggerel. And I'll hope to make the argument today that they're much more than that. Um, I will say I am often asked what I know about the person whose grave has a particularly striking epitaph. And for years, my answer was always not a thing. Um, but the more I engage with uh, people like the NEHGS and the more I present to local historical societies, the more I find that knowing something of the lives of these people really deepens my appreciation of the verse that was chosen. And I hope today, vice versa, that the next time you find yourselves reading a gravestone to inform your research, you will spare a moment to consider what the epitaph is telling you about the person on whose dust you are standing. So let's get started. Most of the inscriptions that I collect date from the last half of the 18th century through the first decades of the 19th century. Earlier than that, the vocabulary of uh, New England funerary practice was much starker and less euphemistic than it became in later days. Uh, there were no cemeteries, there were burial grounds. Uh, not every grave had a carved stone and inscription. For most of the earliest European settlers, a wooden post or an ordinary field stone would do, uh, both long vanished. When there was text on a stone, it's pretty, typically pretty straightforward, as you see here in this example from Amherst, Mass. Um, just name and date. Note, however, that the son's name is present, uh, the son who presumably commissioned and paid for the stone. It's not common, but you do see it occasionally, and it clearly demonstrates the importance of family ties and visibly demonstrating filial devotion. 
in these early communities. Here's another example of a plain stone, this from Williamstown, again, just name and date. But to the point about presenting to this audience, when I showed this stone uh, at a talk I gave in, at the Williamstown Historical Museum, uh, one of the attendees raised their hand and told me the backstory that Peter's mother was a widow up in Pownall, had been accused of witchcraft, uh, was tested by being thrown into the nearly frozen Hoosick River. Uh, but fortunately, uh, the devil did not hold her up afloat. The good news is she sank into the icy depths, proving her innocence, uh, and then was rescued by her captors. But after all that, they she did decide to move her family across the border into Williamstown. All of which to me is just a great example of how genealogical information enriches what would otherwise just be to me an example of a plain gravestone. Uh, when you do find an epitaph on an early stone, it's likely to be a Bible verse. Uh, no surprise, these were familiar texts, orthodox and near to hand. There was a pulpit Bible in, in every community. And if you rose much above the level of subsistence farming, uh, you would own a family Bible. Here's just a really astonishing early composition from Watertown, Mass. I concede that the picture quality is poor, but in my defense, a man who compiled a book of inscriptions in this burial ground in 1869 noted that even then this particular monument was, quote, much out of repair, close quote. The composition of the eulogy is marvelous and unique. Just look at that wonderful opening line, pious Lydia made and given by God as a most meet help. And then that erudite and affectionate list of paired virtues, which I've never seen before. You know, lived by faith, died in peace, went off singing, left us weeping. Uh, it's absolutely unique. So too is the instruction at the bottom to go read her epitaph in your Bible, not on this stone. Uh, the references to Proverbs 31 are perfect choices for a virtuous and well-loved wife and mother. Uh, who can find a virtuous woman? Her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Reading this, I'm sure I see the hand of John Bailey, minister of the gospel, publicly memorializing his beloved wife to his neighbors and fellow congregants. I hope that any family, that any Bailey family history notes this marvelous testimony to his affection and regard. Uh, here's a later example of a Bible verse from Southington, Connecticut. It's a very popular choice in these graveyards uh, from Proverbs 10:7 memory of the just is blessed. You see it over and over. But it's not just a comforting cliche. The full verse, which of course any contemporary reader would have known, is the memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. So the choice of this particular epitaph says a lot about the importance of virtue and remembrance in these early congregational communities. Note, by the way, the intriguing biographical question that the eulogistic prose up above raises. I'm hoping that some Curtis family historian can explain why the Reverend Jeremiah was regularly dismissed at the age of only 46, but then went on to live another 45 years. Um, not quite sure what caused the dismissal. Okay. Here's a stone from Cambridge Mass of the type that I call bespoke. That is verses that as far as I can tell were composed for one individual's grave, the work of a single writer, usually though not always unknown. For me, these are really some of the most engaging and revealing epitaphs, the ones that make me think hardest about the people who created these memorials. Uh, I found, by the way, the transcription in an 1845 book of transcriptions of the old burying ground. Notice how far down the stone sank between when Harris transcribed these inscriptions and when this image was taken, I think sometime in the 1950s. Uh, 
Uh, I don't know from what distant land Abraham Ireland came, possibly Ireland. Uh, I find the last two lines really an interesting expression of faith, praying for grace to enable his great prosperity with which he'd been blessed uh, to fly to Christ. Um, not him, them. And that attribution line, we don't know the name of the relation who composed and presumably paid for this epitaph, but at least we do know it was a relation. Part of that great posterity who is uh, hoping for grace as the same grace that was uh, perhaps given to Abraham. So again, a deliberate public dis display of family respect for the virtuous. Uh, here's another bespoke stone from Barry Mass. Uh, I don't expect you to be able to read every word, um, but it, it seems clear that Susanna Soule did not marry. Uh, it would appear that she predeceased her parents. You can see she was the child in whom we delighted and she was with us, but now she's called away. The reference to her tuneful singing is another sign that this verse was composed by someone who knew her. And the expression of hope that she is now singing in heaven is, I think, quite moving. In the middle there, the reference to holy, pious Job, uh, you know, let us say the Lord he gave, the Lord he takes away. Um, that notion that her death was God's will to which we must submit and the metaphor of the hourglass that has run out, that's familiar imagery, familiar phraseology on these stones. But that mournful expression down at the very end, she's gone, she's gone and never must return. Uh, I find that well composed and truly poignant. On the whole, I think it's a very fine piece of writing and a highly articulate, again, prominently public expression of her parents' grief. I'll note parenthetically that, by the way, that this is a lot of text. Carver's charged by the line, sometimes by the character. So this stone would have been an expensive proposition. On the other hand, the Soul family were very famous carvers over multiple generations. So I suspect this was a uh, on the house job. Okay. Here's a stone also bespoke in Lennox Mass in the graveyard of the church on the hill that tells us quite a bit about family relations in context. Um, we know from lots of research into the business of 18th century gravestone carving that there could be a lag of several years between burial and the raising of a proper stone. Estates had to go through probate, ready cash had to be raised to pay the carver, and even after the commission was set, it took the carver a certain amount of time to finish the job. Delays of even 10 years were not uncommon. This stone apparently was commissioned and carved some quarter century after the subject died. Apparently John Collins's affectionate surviving brother had the means to provide the unnamed wife and family with a proper memorial for their deceased husband and father. Uh, and you can, piece all that together from the, you know, the filial love, the father's gone, but um, raised by uh, in fraternal affection. Uh, one little point, by the way, about this time lag, uh, the recurring phrase that you see on so many of these stones in memory of takes on a real meaning. If you think about a 10 year delay, memories might have been fading and the raising of the stone was an important opportunity to remind us of the lost one, his or her virtues, after an interval of time during which memories might have begun to fade. I would also caution the genealogists one finds errors because of this delay. Uh, literally just by the time they got around to carving it, they'd forgotten exactly what date or year it was the person had died. Rare, but you find it. Okay, two more bespoke, bespoke examples I want to share, uh, each of which has a message that has really nothing to do with the typical con congregationalist devotional sentiments and that I find fascinating for that reason. It really makes you think about who and why this particular message was, was carved for perpetuity. Uh, this is from New Milford, Connecticut. That family tree uh, is unlike anything I've ever seen on these stones. Sometimes I've seen a long list of 
the, the descendants they left. But the, this, these, this, it reminds me of the begats from Luke or Matthew. Uh, so the phrase uh, marble genealogy that occurs down in the epitaph makes sense. Uh, we've just read it above. Um, I read monitor in that last line in the archaic sense of one who watches out and gives warning, like a hall monitor, one who admonishes, uh, which is actually a very striking image for a gravestone. But where on earth do you suppose the language of those first two lines come from? I, I have no clue as to what is really the context for this unexpected assertion. To me, it's an almost metaphysical statement that Samuel Bostwick can no longer use his own voice to encourage us to be virtuous, uh, but his gravestones can. I I'd love to know who thought this up and what they were thinking. And look at this one from Cheshire Mass. This is absolutely sui generis, entirely original and outside of any of the familiar sources and images and messages I typically find in these graveyards. What are we to make of this? What are the intellectual sources this author drew from, whoever he is? The phrase matter is indestructible, I guess can be associated with early ideas of chemistry and atomic theory, but what's it doing in a graveyard in rural Massachusetts? And the idea of nothing out of nothing uh, goes back to classical philosophy. But again, I've not encountered it in this context. The notion that one departs animal life, where does that come from? And where is any trace of Orthodox Christian teaching or consolation here? I can only guess, but I think this might well have been composed by Brown's surviving father. The insertion of juniors might suggest the hand of a senior. I picture an educated old man who keeps himself up on the latest scientific and philosophical journals, though Lord knows how he found them in turn of the 18th century Cheshire, Likely a bit of a crank in the eyes of his neighbors, who are mostly Baptist in this community, by the way, composing this highly personal memorial to a beloved son. Uh, let's see. Um, you will, of course, often find multiple stones of family members adjacent or nearby in these burial stones. Um, and that creates an interesting set of texts in their own right. Here's the first of two in Fairfield, Connecticut, I want to show you. Uh, the source of this text is interesting. You'll note that the author is identified in the lower right there, the poet Matthew Pryor. This is pretty rare, not, not unheard of, but rare. Uh, I've been surprised by how much English and American poetry can be found on these gravestones. Some of the work of famous writers like Shakespeare or Milton or Alexander Pope other sources were famous in their own time, but are now entirely forgotten. Pryor clearly belongs on the low end of the enduring fame spectrum. Born 1664, died 1721. Uh, he was a poet, diplomat, and essayist. The epitaph is from an epic poem called Solomon on the Vanity of the World. I don't recommend it, frankly. It's a pretty ponderous read. Pryor was famous for much shorter, wittier, epigrammatic poems. But it was a popular choice. I find this verse over and over in these graveyards, uh, emphasizing this theme that we should be happy to leave this vain, miserable world. A year old baby she could, should be considered fortunate to have been spared the labor of life. I try to read these texts through the eyes and ears of the people who chose them. And I hope this sentiment uh, gave real comfort to the Solomons. Phyllis's mother is buried nearby. Her epitaph is taken from the rich language of 18th century psalms and hymns, another very common source of epitaphs. Like the Bible passages, these verses would have been familiar to the deceased. Uh, they were central to the re religious life of every family. Hymns and psalms were not just sung in church. They were read, memorized, and recited at home. Look at the language and the imagery here. Martha Silliman's soul is at rest in heaven with her savior, awaiting the resurrection day when her dust will escape the clay. I love the movement, the sense of energy in the lines about springing out, and climbing the shining road. Then comes the section in which we hope she has rejoined her lost child, whom we and all the contemporary readers would have known 
was is Priscilla. I usually ask if anyone recognizes this author, but as you can see for yourself, it's Isaac Watts. Uh, Watts, born 1674, 1748, was an English minister and popular hymn writer, often called the father of English hymnody. He wrote more than 750 hymns. If anyone in the, on this call sings in a church choir, I guarantee you, you've sung a Watts text. Uh, not the music, he, he didn't write the music, but he wrote the words. Watts was an incredibly popular choice for New England epitaphs, uh, as were his poems. He was a major part of everyone's church going and devotional reading at home. He was a very effective self-marketer. He recommended that if little children could learn to recite his hymns, they should be given a book of them. Uh, this particular Epitaph was taken from two different Watts poems you can see on the left that got made into hymns. Here again is that theme of the bright eternal world to come, which is much preferable to this dim and substantial world. Anyway, now we know why Martha Silliman's epitaph talks about hoping to be reunited, reunited with her baby. She died in 1774, less than a year after the death of her infant perhaps of lingering complications, uh, I don't know. Okay, speaking of adjacent family stones, let's look at multiple members of the Walker family back in Lenox, a series of original compositions. The first is uh, Sarah Walker, as you can see, the wife of William Walker. I don't know what caused her sudden departure from this life. Uh, I would look again to family historians for assistance. The first verse sounds rather like a hymn. The poetry is not really fine. Uh, there's nothing terribly original in the imagery and the meter's a, a bit uneven. But I do like that image of the, the passionately warmed soul hastening up into the sky where it encounters the gentle stooping spirits. They seem to be much calmer and more relaxed than the eager and hasty new arrival. Uh, William and Sarah had at least two children who survived to live long lives, but they also lost a son, Richard, in 1784 at the age of four. And here's, you can see Richard Stone in the lower left, and now here's Richard Stone. You can see his mother is just off to the right. This short epitaph was, is inspired by the New England Primer, uh, which taught its young readers, amongst other things, I in the burying ground may see graves shorter there than I, from death's arrest, no age is free, young children too may die. Uh, clearly the, the, that sentiment informs this choice. Um, remember that for these Calvinists, the importance of having your soul ready for death at any moment, young or old, was, a, was of paramount concern. And the death of a child was a particularly teachable moment in the community. So to me, this epitaph is a deliberate statement on the part of uh, walk, uh, the Walker parents. Uh, William remarried to Mary in 1790. I believe as far as I can tell, they have no surviving children. If someone on this call can fill in the blanks, that would be welcome. Their first daughter, Mary, died in 1792. I can't read her age anymore. It's sunk below the ground, uh, but no epitaph as far as I know. Another daughter, Alice, died in 1795, but I can't find her stone. But a year later, Caleb died at one day old. So they lost three infants in four years, death in quick successions indeed. Compared to the more flowery language of Sarah Walker's verse and the ominous warning of Richard's, this to me is a third voice. It's, it's a remarkably transparent, candid statement of anguish by the grieving parents. There's really no sense of religion's consolation here. Uh, the first two lines have a certain rhythm, almost like a hymn. I thought it might be a hymn, but then the next two are shorter, choppier, don't rhyme. Uh, I think this is a fairly direct personal statement. Uh, William and Mary lost yet another son, George, in 1801. George's epitaph is quite touching given his parents' harsh lessons in infant mortality up until now. Though only three weeks old, this infant's lovely form will remain in our fond hearts. Here, the consoling voice of faith in God's covenant 
is present. Perhaps they were becoming more resigned to God's will with time. It's not great poetry, maybe, but it's a skilled piece of work for the time and place. I would really give a great deal to understand who the author or authors of this sequence of epitaphs might have been. Uh, as for the parents themselves, uh, William lived until 1831. Uh, he died at the age of 80. Uh, and he just has that square obelisk on the left. There's actually a great big, long, fine prose eulogy inscribed, but it's no longer legible. I had to find a, uh, another book of transcription, an historic book of transcriptions to read it. Uh, Mary died in 1838 at the age of 78, having survived those childbirth years herself. Simple stone with no epitaph. Let's look at one last Walker stone that I think is reading, worth reading carefully. Apparently, after Hulda died in 1788, as you can see, her husband, Caleb, did not immediately commission a stone for her. There might have been a temporary marker. Uh, Caleb was still in the prime of his life, just 36 years old. And then two years later, unexpectedly, while on a visit to upstate New York, maybe on business, family matters, seeking a second wife, we don't know, Caleb dies and is buried somewhere out there. His dust and Hulda's, though kindred, are scattered wide, as we can read in the first line of the epitaph. They are collecting black rust in separate lonely tombs, note the plural. I can do no more than speculate here, but maybe William Walker, whom we've just been looking at, was Caleb's brother, and thus the namesake of unfortunate little Caleb. William could quite conceivably have commissioned a single stone to commemorate his late brother and sister-in-law, and perhaps also the verse. Uh, because piling speculation upon speculation, if you read this epitaph and Sarah Walker's together, they have strong similarity of diction and rhythm, could well have been the same hand composing them. And I mention this because uh, in response to my article that was mentioned earlier, uh, an American ancestor's correspondent knew from his ancestor's journals that this ancestor liked to write poetry, uh, was an amateur poet, and believes that he had composed his son's epitaph, which is carved in a very similar style. So I urge you all, read those journals, read those commonplace books, uh, see what the sources might be, and see if it connects to something you might find uh, on a family epitaph. Okay, here's one more bespoke epitaph from the Sun Center Cemetery in Lee uh, that I really want to bring your attention to. You know, the opening lines are nice, they're kind of lofty. I haven't seen them anywhere else, so I think they're original, uh, an original composition, though the notion of the soul winging its way to eternal light is not particularly original. Those last lines, they come at the very bottom. Uh, this, this is actually taken from a poem by the Reverend Timothy Dwight, a famous late Puritan clergyman and president of Yale. The Conquest of Canaan, another great big long ponderous poem I won't recommend to you. Uh, but at least whoever created this epitaph was an educated person who knew their Yale clerics, knew American poetry, was familiar with the language and imagery of hymnody. But let me show you what's in the middle of this verse, of this epitaph. This is worth reading carefully. Um, there, gentle spirit, may you find the happiness denied you here. Peace and harmony join, nor can detraction enter there. There are no aspersing, there no aspersing tongue can send its venom to thy heart. Someone, surely Cornelius, has composed a very personal, sympathetic memorial to a woman whose happiness, peace, and harmony were ruined by aspersion and the detraction of venomous tongues. He paid to have this <laughs> carved for his fellow townspeople to read in perpetuity. You know, I'm writing about her, but I'm talking to you. How do you suppose the community reacted to this bitter accusation? What do you suppose brought it on? All in all, I would like to learn a great deal more about Nancy and Cornelius Fessenden and the context for this epitaph. Uh, 
Okay, as seen in the story of the sad, the sad story of the Walker children, and as, as I'm sure is known to all of you, infant mortality was a terrible fact of life for these people, often recorded in the burial grounds and often a source of remarkable epitaphs. Here are the stones of three brothers in Greenfield, Mass. Uh, they all died within two weeks in August of 1802 of smallpox, I believe. Um, the verse, which is over on the right-hand one on Stephen's gravestone, is taken from the leading light of a group known as the Graveyard Poets. This enormously popular school of writers played a very big role in the literary and spiritual life of the 18th century. They composed elegiac poems using some recurring themes, like an evening visit to a graveyard, so one-dimensional characters whose names represent either virtue or vice, observations of nature like a storm or a nightfall or a garden, to illustrate religious lessons in an easy, accessible way for popular readership. They wrote about the inevitability of death, the uncertainty of its timing, its, level effect, its leveling effect on all rank and privilege, the consequent vanity of our mortal ambitions and pursuits, and the supreme importance of living virtuously in order to secure eternal happiness. At their worst, they could be a little repetitive and a little overblown, but at their best, they gave early New Englanders a deeply moving literature for their devotional reading that went far beyond the standard fare of Calvinist sermons and religious tracts. The poet here is Edward Young, 1683 to 1685. Young is by far the single most popular writer I have found in these burial grounds, and yet I'd never heard of him before I got into this project. He wrote one tremendously successful work called The Complaint or Night Thoughts on Life, Death, and Immortality. Its success was staggering. By the way, after a long career of unsuccessful poetry, its success was staggering. It was translated into all the languages of Europe, endlessly reprinted all over England and New England. Uh, and apparently a version of it reached Greenfield where it touched the hearts of Lucinda and Daniel Clay. In a similar vein, uh, I wonder if that same contagion reached the hill town of Blandford, Mass, not that far away, a month after it destroyed the Clay Brothers. Uh, here, this is a, it is a very remote windswept hilltop town. So I think the image of the sun dropping down in the West is surely appropriate for the setting. The choice of language and the tone is really poignant. These children did not just begin to die at birth, they were doomed to die at birth. Um, consider too the aching sorrow implicit in the statement, these were the children of. Not two of the children or even children, which might imply surviving siblings. That brutal definite article to me suggests this was the entire family. The winter that followed must have been unbearable for William and Sarah Ferguson as for the Clay parents. I will say this is not bespoke, but it's an example of what I call a locally recurring verse. Uh, the identical text appears one town over in Otis, Massachusetts at about the same time. So it must have been read and, and uh, disseminated in some fashion locally. Uh, while we're on the subject, it's not just disease that threatened children. Here's a stone from Pepperell Mass with a lot to unpack. Uh, you can start with that image up on the tympanum. The carver shows little Aaron, Aaron Bowers and two of the stock or stack of boards that we read on the right fell and crushed him to death. This short verse is actually an amazing piece of work. It's a little sermon taking as its text a passage from the first epistle of John 521 Little children, keep yourselves from idols, amen. But it reverses the role of the adult and the child. Here, the unfortunate toddler admonishes his parents to stop their inappropriate grieving and resign themselves to God's will. And the threat of God frowning upon you is deathly serious. For a religious reader of this time, to be frowned upon by God meant to perish forever. 
Now, of course, these are not Little Aaron's words. They're the work of another now anonymous local writer. I just think this is taken in its totality. This is really a, a perfect example of the original creativity these people were capable of summoning in order to express their individual attitudes towards life and death. A moment ago, when we were uh, up in Blandford, I, I mentioned uh, the phenomenon of a locally recurring epitaph. Here, here's another example, one that recurs more frequently, but still uh, pretty much constrained to the Berkshires in central Massachusetts. Um, nice, simple, short little uh, couplet. You will find that uh, the same family chose the same verse twice, first here in Tiringham, Massachusetts, and then just two years later, Christine's mother, Mary, uh, uses an almost identical text over in Monterey. Uh, next slide. It's the same carver, I think. If you look, the, that the sole effigy is basically the same. Those little uh, spirals in the, uh, in the shoulders and the, the, the sand dollar representing the resurrection uh, directly above the sole effigy. So I'm pretty sure it's the same carver. It can be found all over New England, once or twice in the mid-Atlantic with minor variations in the text. So it's a simple enough little verse, but that said, someone took the time to compose it and it was printed in a pamphlet or almanac or broadside and then distributed and purchased and read. These recurring epitaphs give me a glimpse of a lost world of small scale printing and dissemination of printed material and also of these people incorporating this reading material into their devotional studies. I'd love to find this little verse in print, but I expect that it was never more than a piece of ephemera and that all copies have long since turned to dust, like Mary and Christine Garfield. Okay, no talk on epitaphs could possibly be complete without this one, a verse so commonly found that I have come to refer to it simply as the classic. Um, Reuben Ingram's epitaph, this is from Amherst Mass, by the way, uh, is the most common, sort of the pure version, uh, though I found many variants of the same text. A lot of ink has been spilled over the years trying to identify the source, but frankly, the origins remain lost in the mist of time. It actually goes all the way back to classical times, the message of traveler, traveler, what you are, I was, what I am now, you will also be can be found carved on roadside Roman tombs. Uh, the point to emphasize here is that in 18th century New England, there was nothing cliched about this text, no matter how often it was chosen. Everyone who read it knew death posed a terrible risk if your soul was not well prepared. The warning had been preached in every pulpit and was central to everyone's private devotional reading. Preparing for death was a well understood task with a very specific meaning for these Calvinist congregations. This is not the time or place, you will be relieved to hear, for a long digression on the fierce theological disputes between old light traditionalists and new light revivalists about how to prepare for death, which were tearing apart parishes all across New England at this time. But there was no disagreement about the need to prepare. To die unprepared in a state of sin would result in eternal damnation in a very real hell. So for, the, so for the contemporary reader, this was not a trite or commonplace choice. It had real relevance and real urgency. But look now, 15 years later, here's his widow's stone directly adjacent. Very different sounding message. Uh, the, the essential premise is not too different that our mortal bodies are feeble, uh, we're trifles, brittle clay. But Phoebe's epitaph is taken from another Watts hymn. Rather than giving the reader a dire warning to prepare, Watts, and by extension Phoebe, assert confidently that we know our days must fly, we'll spend them in wisdom's way, therefore, and as a result, we will soon be wafted to a peaceful shore. And I put these two side by side because, to make the point that these Congregationalists were constantly wrestling with these two conflicting attitudes towards death. As one scholar has written, they were gripped individually and collectively 
by an intense and unremitting fear of what might happen after death, while simultaneously clinging to the Christian view of death as a release and relief for the earthbound soul. There's a lot of uh, scholarly writing about these two contemporaneous overlapping conflicting attitudes and how they play out in sermons and religious writing. I see the same struggle recorded in the gravestones. In this case, husband and wife side by side. I think these stones are trying to tell us a little something about Reuben and Phoebe, however faint the message is now, 215 years later. Here's another couple buried together, this time under a single stone in Beckett, Massachusetts. Uh, the epitaph is derived from the famous Nunc Dimittis or Canticle of Simeon in Luke 2. Uh, Simeon, as you may know, is an old man who has been promised by the Holy Spirit that he will not die until he sees the Messiah. So when Mary brings the infant Jesus into the temple, Simeon is there and he cries out, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. The cadence and rhyme of this verse may remind you of the Martha Silliman epitaph, and sure enough, it is an Isaac Watts hymn his rendition of that passage. Isn't it just a lovely comforting thought? The two old Eames, content that they have seen the way to salvation, passing peacefully into the arms of their Lord. It raises the question of who chose these epitaphs. Uh, possibly sometimes the, uh, the decedent themselves, this could have been a favorite of old Rachel, dog-eared in, in her hymnal or transcribed in a commonplace book. But I think more often, uh, death came suddenly and unexpectedly for these people, even in old age. So this may have been chosen by a surviving child or the minister. I'll never know for sure, uh, but if anyone here today knows more about the Eames family history, perhaps there's a clue somewhere. Let me end with this stone in Otis Mass. Um, it's a little late for my collecting period, but it, it's so marvelous that I really have to include it. The epitaph is the, it's actually sort of meta. It is a direct uh, reproduction of the epitaph that concludes one of the most popular poems in the English language, Thomas Gray's Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard. You probably recognize the line about the paths of glory lead but to the grave. Um, I must have reread that poem dozens of times over the years, but it took James Merrill's gravestone to make me appreciate the power of those last lines with their poignant demand that we leave the soul of the deceased young man and all its frailties alone in the deep hope that it rests peacefully in paradise with his God you must understand that this great this burial ground is couldn't be more remote and rural. Yet there was a settlement near it in its time, but now it's it's off the main road, uh, very little around it. As a choice of epitaph for such a remote rural uh, spot, it just cannot be surpassed. I don't know anything about Dr. Michael Merrill, but I'm convinced he knew and admired Gray's elegy and he knew his and loved his son very much, knew of course, loved his son very much, and he felt that it was an appropriate, there was something about this text that he and Artemisia felt was appropriate for memorializing James. So, I hope I've managed to interest you in how family relationships can add context to the choice of these epitaphs and vice versa. Of course, I welcome hearing from anyone who cares to share an interesting epitaph uh, you may have come across in the course of your work or the probate records of the books they own to see what they read. I can't emphasize that enough either. So in closing, let me just say again that for these early congregationalists, the question of what happens after death was a matter of constant anxiety and prayer and conflicting feelings of fear and hope. A funeral was not just a private family matter it was a teachable moment for the whole community and an opportunity, therefore, to express their feelings publicly. So I really encourage you to hear and appreciate the voice of the individuals who chose or composed these verses and the degree of intention reflected in the words.
These epitaphs are not mere dog roll. They were meant for the survivors, for us to read and attend to. If you're, if of interest, of course, I welcome you to get a copy of my book. And now I would be very happy to take questions. Wow, John, I have to say that I, I don't think anyone listening today is going to take <laughs> these epitaphs for granted anymore, that we're going to look at them again. We're going to go back to our um, our research and maybe some of these burying grounds and cemeteries and, and take a, an, a second look, a closer look at uh, the epitaphs and inscriptions on our ancestors' gravestones. Uh, but before we get to questions, I do want to uh, tell everyone about a few upcoming events. Um, so next Tuesday, we welcome author Dan Bauck, who will talk about his new book, Democracy's Data, The Hidden Stories in the U.S. Census and How to Read Them. Um, he'll be looking specifically at the 1940 census and how those questions and the information provided really helped shape uh, public policy for generations. Um, then starting on September 7th, we have a three-week online course on organizing your research, your files, and your findings. And if you just can't get enough of cemeteries, I don't think any of us can, um, on October 6th, Chief Genealogist David Allen Lambert will be discussing the importance of cemetery transcriptions, where to find them online, in published resources, and in manuscript collections. Um, and you can find out uh, more information about all of our events at AmericanAncestors.org slash events. All right, so let's get to your questions. I know uh, many of you have typed questions in uh, to the Q&A throughout the presentation, which is great. And we're gonna try to get through as many as we can. Um, so first, John, stepping back, uh, what are the differences between a cemetery, a graveyard, and a burying ground? Time, literally just when we're talking about uh, in the earliest days, the early, earliest settlements, when everything was pretty much functional and a matter of survival, it was a burial ground. It was set aside as a piece of ground, you know, not the common ground for burial. Um, the word cemetery really only starts to come in into the 19th century um, when lots of euphemisms began to arise around funerary practice. Um, and uh, you, you wind up, uh, I, this, I could give a very long answer to that, but it, it's really a matter of time and attitude towards death and funeral practice. Uh, now, Brian asks, um, do you know what the tradition is or kind of what tradition led to using the term amiable consort instead oh, yes. of wife? Um, well, uh, instead of, it was a just a, a term of usage at the time, uh, amiable, literally loved, lovable um, in the literal sense of the word. Consort was used um, to uh, denote uh, the a, a wife who predeceased the husband. Relict is a synonym for widow. It's interesting. The word wife does appear. The word widow rarely. Uh, so uh, I can't say exactly what other than personal choice determined the two uh, between wife and consort. I, I will say that. Uh, uh, as you saw in many of these carvings, there's the 18th century tradition of the long S, which looks a little bit like an F. And I once had a, a audience member ask me why would they refer to as the comfort, and I had to explain that that wasn't quite what it was saying. Um, let's see. We have another question. Um... Sarah asks, would all the couple stones, you, sh we showed, uh, you showed a few examples of couples, their stones um, almost being tied together, um, would they have been engraved and erected after the death of the last one? Definitely. Uh, I say definitely. Today, as, we, as you know, uh, it is often the case that a stone intended for two will have only the, the first decedents, and then they'll fill in the blank. Uh, when the second person dies, uh, given the expense uh, associated with this stone, I'm I would I would bet my bottom dollar that uh, the first to pass would have a temporary marker of some sort, and then it really wasn't until uh, the the survivors took in hand the commissioning of the stone for the second one to die that it would be put together. The exception, of course, is if one did remarry, uh, 
then it was uh, then you would you might well erect a stone to the first wife. Uh, you know, uh, with and then save the double headed stone for the second. Hmm. There too, there's all kinds of variations. You see stones with first and second wife listed. It it, it can get complicated, but that would be my answer. Great. Um, you talked a bit about some of the economics around uh, some of these lengthy inscriptions or very involved carvings. Um, Susanna asks, were gravestones expensive? Um, do we have any invoices from, from the carvers uh, from this time period? Oh boy, yes, we do. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of articles in the Association for Gravestone Studies uh, literature. I don't have the citations at my fingertips that look very much at the um, account books of carvers. Uh, I had the great good fortune to go to the Concord, Massachusetts Free Public Library and look at the account book of Ithamar Spalden, a 1790s carver there. Uh, and it, it's really quite marvelous because you can see him recording in his ledger that Mr. Howe came in and paid him thus and such for his wife stone. And then you can go out in the cemetery and uh, there's the stone in Spalden's distinctive style. Um, let me put it this way, uh, like a lot of craft work, the, the expensive stones were expensive. The nice stones, the, the, the well-decorated stones uh, were expensive and text was absolutely by the line, sometimes by the character. So the decision to have a multi-line, multi-verse epitaph carved was uh, a material one. I sometimes get questions about, did everyone have a gravestone? You know, do, do the plain ones indicate, you know, lower socioeconomic status? I, I really can't be certain about that. There was certainly an element of personal choice about whether you wanted to make a big statement. Um, but yeah, a, a nicely dressed stone was a material expense that, you know, ready cash had to be raised for it, which sometimes took years. Uh, now, Tom asks, are there many early stones that you come across that give the cause of death? I know we saw, I think, Aaron Bowers, that really, what I would think an yep. unusual stone um, that had the boards even depicted that killed him. But yep. I mean, uh, that's a little dramatic. Uh, the answer is it's not infrequent. And in fact, I, I have a chapter in the book on um, sudden death and drowning in a, uh, a river, drowning in the flume of a mill, um, falling on a pitchfork from a, the top of a haystack, which if you can imagine, uh, the fall of a tree was fairly common. Uh, so not all the time, but by no means infrequent. All right. Um, there were a few questions, well, several questions about kind of the iconography and, you know, I know that's not necessarily the focus of this talk, but, um, you know, is there anything to be, um, you know, can you infer anything as to whether, you know, if a, if a stone has a imagery and carving or if it doesn't? So I, I, great question. And first of all, let me begin by referring you to, the, there really is a wonderful, extensive literature on this. The, the, the godfather of them all is Alan Ludwig's uh, Graven Images. And if it, it'll be in most good libraries, I think you can still find it on, online used. Um, it's just a wonderful, beautiful to look at, wonderful and accessible, accessible book as scholarly books go. Um, I, I'm not sure what you, what you can attribute uh, to the choice of any one image. I mean, there are some obvious ones. Every now and then you see Masonic symbols. Um, but in general, they're a little abstract. And uh, I really just have to refer you to that literature for the interplay between the extent to which an individual or the, or the survivors might request a certain image versus how much of that was proprietary to the carver. I think it's a safe generalization to say that if you went to a particular carver to have a stone done, uh, 
the decoration would be mostly a matter of what the carver was accustomed to doing. That's where their style and their hand really shows the the the, the kind of face they carved, uh, the kinds of symbolism they put around it. Whereas the text, I think, is much more likely to have been uh, commissioned by the by the family. I, th I think the carvers were. There's evidence that the carvers tended to be order takers of the uh, epitaphs. I'm not sure that answered the question, but. Well, you gave a great, a, a great source, yeah. <laughs> um, Sally says one of my ancestors has, quote, there is rest in heaven, end quote. Do you know where poem that might be from? And I think maybe a more general question too is how do you learn or find the origins of, uh, you know, where that, where these sayings or epitaphs are coming from? Uh, two great questions. Uh, on the first one, yes, it's, it, you see it everywhere. Uh, I mostly associate that with getting on into the decades of the 1800s. Um, I'd be, I, I defer to, obviously, to the, was it Sally as to the date of the ancestor's uh, death? Um, Prior to, and, and the reason it only became popular a little later, uh, and I, by the way, I do not think it has a specific source. It, it sounds like a Bible verse, but it isn't. It, it, it's obviously a comforting sentiment very much in the tradition of the, of the Watts hymns. But I think the important thing to look at carefully there is that plenty of these early Calvinists would have said, you sure about that? I'm not. <laughs> uh, and I think that reflects an era when maybe uh, Unitarian Universalism has begun be, to become more widespread. And this notion of wrestling with the fate of your soul had given way to, um, look, there's rest in heaven. Uh, relax. You, you've probably been virtuous. You've probably been a good person. You know, for argument's sake, let's say that everything's going to be okay. Um, my brother, who is a scholar of the religion of the time, refers to universe, universalism after Calvinism as tennis without a net. Um, as to where I find the text, I cannot lie. Google is just an amazing resource. I mean, certainly by now I've come to recognize, I can usually tell a Watts hymn, I can usually tell a, a, an Edward Young verse, uh, Alexander Pope, whom we haven't touched on, uh, is very popular. But for some of these more obscure poets, it's 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 like uh, you know finding a hitherto undiscovered butterfly. You know, I, I get to run home, look it up, and uh, I mean, just the other day, I found one that turns out was written by a now completely forgotten uh, British naval surgeon who wrote a series of essays reflecting on life and war and slavery and so forth. That. Uh, were enormously popular at the time. And that was his little epitaph to his wife. And someone in, uh, I'm blanking on where it is now, um, had picked it up and it's the only time I've seen it. Uh, Cops Hill, Cops Hill in Boston. First time I've ever seen it. Um, Christine notes, often it appears as though the engraver didn't plan very well to make yep. the words fit onto the stone. <laughs> uh, did families ever request kind of remakes? Or, Doubt you it. Know? Mm. Christine, have you ever had a contractor that didn't necessarily work out perfectly? There's one in, in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, which is literally he just started over again and did the started the line from scratch it didn't scratch out the old one didn't want to start with a fr i mean think about it it's a great big huge piece of marble or sandstone or um or whatever granite so uh yeah they often would you'd think they'd be able to lay it out more carefully but they sometimes had to squeeze a line in there were you know the typos are interesting uh as i hope i've impressed upon you. These were literate people. They read a lot. They could write. Uh, spelling was just pretty erratic. And by the time you go from perhaps a, you know, a, a poem by Phyllis Wheatley to the person who transcribed it in a commonplace book to the person who took that and handed it to a carver and said, carve this to what the carver actually produced, uh, plenty of opportunity for some uh, 
erratum to, to errata to, to uh, sneak in. Right, just but to- yeah, it, it, was, it was a handcraft with all the associated risks. Great. Um, just a few more questions because we're, we're basically at time, but there are so many great questions. Uh, first, Joyce asks, to what extent are the New England epitaphs different from maybe what you see in England and Europe during this time? And can you infer anything from those similarities or differences? Sure. Uh, a lot of commonality with England. It's quite clear that many of them came over from England. There were some volumes, anthologies at the time of, sort of exemplary uh, epitaphs. I actually produced in England. I actually expected to find a lot of New England epitaphs sourced from those. And the answer is some, but not a lot. I think they flowed much more from the devotional poetry, um, the hymnody, et cetera. That's answer number one. Answer number two, and this gets me very deep into you know, American studies, but there are certainly very different traditions of reading of religion and of funeral practice as you go to New York State, Mid-Atlantic, let alone the South. Generally speaking, the, the epitaphs that I find in New England show up with some frequency in New York, not Dutch New York, but, but English New York, some frequency in Pennsylvania, though obviously not in German or Quaker Pennsylvania, and then they really peter out by the time you get to the mid-Atlantic and the South. We're just into a different, different set of traditions. And maybe one final question. Um, you mentioned kind of typos or errata uh, a moment ago. And uh, what if the either person's name is misspelled or it's just completely wrong? <laughs> it's just the parents are wrong or... I, one likes to think that didn't happen too often because they would have been working from a commission sheet. Um, I guess the, not to be glib, but the answer to that is don't know because the that stone was never erected and is not available for me to look at. Um, the, the names, uh, there, there's one example I'm blanking on where I think they had to Go back and correct the name. Yeah, you could. You can tell that the 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 name had been misspelled because there's a depression in the stone. He literally scraped it out and carved below it. And there's another one I mentioned that time passes and memories fade. Uh, there's one in Stockbridge, Mass, where the guy died in the last day of Shay's Rebellion, and we know when that year was. And there's his, and it says that he died in that battle, and the date of of death is precisely a year wrong. <laughs> so, uh, and it's a great big fancy stone. So I'm sure that was time passing. And there's another where the, it was like May the blank. There's literally a blank on the stone and it never got filled in. And uh, it was just purely imagination, but one imagines the carver going, well guys, what was the date? And by the time they got around to finishing the stone, they, they couldn't be sure, and they left it out. Just a little, and I don't say that to be critical, it's just marvelous evidence of the handcraftedness of this whole process, uh, including, the, including the survivors who are the customers. Well, thank you again, John. Um, fortunately, that's all the time that we have to, for today. Um, but thank you, everyone, for your very thoughtful and wonderful questions. Um, if you have more specific questions about today's topic, you can reach out to John directly at readinggravestones at gmail.com. You see that on your screen. Additionally, you can go to AmericanAncestors.org slash chat to take advantage of our free chat with a genealogist service. It's a great way if you have a quick reference question. It's free. It's available to all. And that's uh, Tuesday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. with extended hours 9 to 8 on Wednesdays.
So thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free and to create other uh, free programs for you. Um, be well, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.